Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Dr. Alvea Romero, Director of the Francis McClellan Institute for Children and Youth and Families. And we are very happy to organize and present the Turbicle Speaker Series. So uh, just a quick uh, reminder, we always honor Francis McClellan to start out with. Francis was a great business leader and philanthropist here in Arizona. And it's really her legacy about improving the lives of children, youth, and families that we carry forward through our research at the Institute of Huron Campus. Uh, we always want to thank Pamela Turbeville uh, for supporting this speaker series. Uh, Pamela is a University of Arizona alumni, and she received the CALB Alumni Award in 2000. And um, I don't know if she's on today, but hi, Pam, because she's always around and available and was even here this week at Dogs and Denim. So she's a very active, uh, continually active member of the Norton School. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Katie Ziders to introduce our guest speaker today. Thank you. It's an honor to be introducing Dr. Gus Carlo. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Carlo is a Millsap Professor at University of Multicultural Studies in the Department of Human Development and Family Science at Mizzou. He is the pro-social researcher in the field. He has the most widely used, widely used um, measure of pro-social tendency in the literature. He's published over 200 articles, hard to believe, and edited 12 volumes. He's, uh, he has funding from both NIH and NSF, and he has served as, as an associate editor of numerous journals, including Developmental Psychology and his Journal of Research and also a recipient of an SRA Mentor Award, relatively recent, Templeton APA Positive Psychology Award, and then a Fellow of APS and APA. And on a personal note, um, he's a supportive and inspiring senior colleague who works with junior faculty to help with their success. I was a recipient of his support at Mizzou, uh, at Mizzou before the U of A, and that's where I got to know um, Gus. So it's my pleasure to introduce him and Thank you so much for that nice introduction and welcome everyone. Thank you for inviting me to a nice weather place in the U.S. Um, there was a little bit of a snowstorm on the way over to Arizona. It's delayed me by about a day, but we won't get into the gory details of all that. Thank you very much to Andrea for having me here. Oh, thank you. Uh, and also inviting me here. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here, especially in the presence of a group of scholars that are actually doing fantastic and excellent work, uh, especially in the area of uh, Latino uh, scholarship, Latino Latina populations. Um, I um, have been uh, involved and interested in the study of pro-social development and moral development um, for a long time. Um, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about that line of work, um, which sort of permeates throughout all the work that I do. Um, and you'll get a little bit of a taste of um, how broad that this line of work sort of extends out to a little bit but I'm not going to overwhelm you with, um, or torture you with some of the really weird projects that we're also involved in um, that are farther afield from uh, today's talk. I always like to start out by making sure that we're all on the same page with regards to what is pro-sociality and, and, and specifically what is pro-social behaviors. Um, Pro-social behaviors um, have, there are very many different definitions of pro-social behaviors, but the one that we adopt is a pretty straightforward one. Um, pro-social behaviors refers to actions that benefit others. Uh, so as you can tell from this definition, the emphasis is on the consequence of the action, whether it's beneficial to the receiver. Um, and you can think of sort of many different common day um, everyday experiences that um, that really fall into this category of behaviors, things like sharing and donating, volunteering, comforting, saying nice things to people, like Katie was saying to me, 
just now. Um, you know, um, blood donors, organ donors, um, there's quite a wide range. Um, and you can probably, if you take some time to think about it, you can probably start to imagine that that wide range has really, has some really important meaning to it. We all have different tendencies to engage in pro-social behaviors. Uh, even individuals that we might not always think of as being pro-social engage in pro-social behaviors. A little example that I always like to give are gang members, for example. As we know, gang members are very pro-social, but their pro-social activities are limited to their own in-group members, right? Um, and of course, they're very antisocial to members that are not being this part of their group. You can sort of cut and slice pro-social behaviors along several different dimensions. One dimension that I'm going to highlight uh, for now is um, the underlying motivation for why you help somebody. You can help somebody for either selfish reasons or you might help somebody for selfless reasons. And when I say selfless, I'm really talking about altruistic actions that are primarily intended to benefit the other. So there may be some self-reward. We all usually feel pretty good when we help somebody, right? You get that, sometimes you get that feeling of goodness from helping somebody, right? Um, but the question is not so much whether you get any reward, self-reward. The question is whether you actually engage in that behavior to obtain that self-reward. And if we think about some of the forms of altruistic actions that, well, I'll ask some of you. Can you give me some examples of what would be an altruistic action of behavior? Blood. Blood, okay. So giving blood, you're giving blood to a stranger, probably, right? You don't know who's going to end up getting that blood. Um, and it's certainly voluntary, usually. Some people might get paid to do it, but not all blood donors get paid to do it, right? And sometimes we are um, motivated to engage in blood donate, donating, blood, donating blood, sorry. Um, if there's like a disaster or something like that, right? American Red Cross or something like that. But again, you're probably not ever going to see the person or persons who receive that blood. Um, so there's probably going to be very little chance that you're going to actually directly receive any kind of feedback that would help you make you know help make you feel good. It's another example of altruism. Maybe a more extreme example. Saving a child from getting hit by a car? I'm sorry? Saving a child from getting hit by a car. Saving a child, okay, that's pretty extreme. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean sometimes you do hear of somebody that risked their life right? Uh, a mother or some, could be a stranger, that risked their lives in order to save the life of someone else, right? Um, uh, we think of um, firefighters, for example. Firefighters, yes, they get paid, but we all know they don't get paid enough. <laughs> and certainly, what would be enough to be, that would be worth it to risk your life, right? Um, nurses, doctors, um, a soldier who throws him or herself on a grenade that's about to explode and harm and per perhaps kill uh, their comrades, right? Um, all kinds of risky and um, sometimes life or death kinds of situations. We see videos of these sorts of things every once in a while on YouTube and you're on somebody who throw themselves into a river to save a kid that's, you know, or even a dog, right? Um, so, so altruistic behaviors are particularly interesting. Um, they've been in very interesting to scholars, for philosophers, and across different disciplines, uh, because they really do bring up important questions and deep questions about the nature of humans, right? Whether we're inherently good or inherently bad, both, or in the international Some of that because that's kind of beyond um, the scope of today's talk. 
So, <clears throat> somewhat earlier, a long, long time ago, in a galaxy far away, um, I and uh, my research team decided to start thinking about the different forms of pro-social behaviors that we see out there and that we can observe. And there are, again, different ways of categorizing and classifying these behaviors, um, but based on literature review um, and also based on some focus groups that we conducted with parents and adolescents, we came up with um, six forms. It's not comprehensive, so you know, let's not get carried away here because there are a lot of different forms. But we came up with at least six pretty common forms uh, and within these six are specific behaviors that sort of fall under this, um, each of these categories. The first one is dire or emergency situations. I think we were just talking about those kinds of situations, right? Uh, so these are crisis um, situations. The second one is compliant uh, helping. And this is when someone asks you to help them, right? A teacher might ask a child, can you help me? clean up the classroom or something like that, right? Or a parent might ask their kid to, you know, can you go help your grandmother with something? The third one is emotional. Emotional, these are situations that are emotionally evocative situations. Um, you know, very distressful, where the cues for distress are very obvious, okay? And these can be pretty intense emotional situations. The fourth one is anonymous, helping, and so it's pretty straightforward, right? Donating money anonymously, for example, or the blood don donation sort of thing that might be uh, anonymous. Um, public, which is helping in front of an audience. Um, um, and then altruistic, which we define, again, as sort of helping primarily for other, uh, another person's benefit with little or no ex expectation for self-reward. Okay, so there's no expectation that you would get something from helping people. These things vary across situations. These things vary across underlying motives. Um, they also, we have um, studied these six forms of uh, behaviors across adolescence and uh, young adulthood, and actually even older adulthood. Um, and we developed a measure, which we call the pro-social tendencies measure. Um, and we have a couple of different versions of this. And again, we've conducted quite a bit of, we think, pretty good, at least in our field. There's not a lot of um, other measures that have been as extensively validated uh, and tested for all kinds of different dimensions of um, their psychometric properties. Okay, now uh, we can move on a little bit, hopefully. So let's step back. Why should we care about pro-social behaviors? Why should, why should that's Carlo that's some his whole career? Oh my God, <laughs> I'm gonna start crying. Um, why should we care about these sorts of behaviors? Um, well, so I'm gonna give you a little pitch. This is my plug. Be ready for it. First, pro-social behaviors are a marker of morality. So in the moral development field, there's been a tradition uh, that goes a few decades back that was you know, sort of initiated by cognitive, cognitive developmental theorists. And the emphasis in the moral development field for many, many, for several decades was focusing on the moral reason, the way people think about moral opportunities or opportunities to help other people, pro-social opportunities. And in fact, they minimized or ignored uh, behaviors as well as moral emotions. We're not going to go too far down that track because I just want to give you a little background on where the field was and why our work is sort of has evolved to where it is. <clears throat> you know, we can always um, make assertions that people's morality, I mean, how do we judge people's moral standing or their moral character? We could 
make that judgment on the basis of what they say, but you're going to probably see that my bias is going to be on what they do and not what they say. Um, so you can see right away why the traditional approach to moral development was just not very uh, appealing to me. And we have, um, um, we've, you know, we have a number of studies where we demonstrate that pro-social behaviors are in fact a good marker of moral development and in fact it's correlated with moral reasoning. So it's not the same as moral reasoning but it is uh, positively correlated. It's also correlated with things like sympathy and empathy and it's correlated with things that are a bit more complex that we don't have a lot of time to get into but the notion of moral identity uh, and individuals who may be that, that we may consider to be moral exemplars. And again, you just need to reflect a little bit on maybe historical figures, people in history that, that you may consider to be a moral exemplar, a moral hero, someone who has exhibited moral courage. And if we think about those individuals, a lot of times, in fact, most of the time, and maybe all of the time, we consider them to be moral exemplars based on their actions and not just on what they say. Secondly, it turns out that being pro-social is actually healthy for us. And it's healthy for adolescents, it's healthy for children. And this is a small, modest sort of body of literature at this point, but it's a rapidly growing body of literature. And its links to positive health are not just um, behavioral health, but also psychological health. So right off the bat, probably the easiest under, uh, way to understand this link is to think about um, the fact that pro-social behaviors are negatively associated with aggression, aggressive behaviors, with things like substance use and illegal drug use, with problem drinking, with risky sex, um, and so on and so on. So it's negatively related with externalizing problems. Uh, and that's pretty consistent in the literature. It's not to say that being pro-social means you're not antisocial. Let's not, not get carried away here, you know. It's like the presence of one doesn't mean the absence of the other by any means. And you can have individuals who are high on both pro-social and sort of antisocial behaviors. Um, but again, that's beyond the scope. With regards to psychological health, well, I already said, and a couple of you at least nodded along with me, that when you help somebody, you, you feel good, right? But it turns out that pro-social behaviors, kids who, in, who have a tendency to engage in pro-social behaviors, actually are less prone to depressive symptoms, report less depressive symptoms. They also report less anxiety, although it looks like it may be specific to social anxiety. And that kind of makes sense in a way, because if you have social anxiety, you may be less prone to help. And which brings up the point that cause and effect thing here is, hasn't been really disentangled. And that's something that maybe one of you would do for your thesis or dissertation. Um, and um, we've also linked it to physical health, mark, uh, indices of physical health. So a good colleague of mine from UBC, um, Kim Schoner Reichel, uh, conducted an intervention study where they taught kids to be more pro-social, and there are some really good programs out there. Um, and they examined uh, various uh, physical health uh, markers and they found for example that the kids who were in the intervention condition demonstrated lower C-reactive proteins and so those are the inflammatory sort of proteins that are bad for us physical health wise uh, and that's just one little example again there's not a lot of work in this area but 
there's very suggestive work, um, provocative sort of work. I'll also kind of tease you with one of my favorite studies that's out there, which is uh, the Danner Longitudinal Study of, um, uh, of Nuns. Uh, so this was this, uh, a study conducted over 30 years where they went back and they accessed the diaries of nuns um, and they coded their diaries and maybe to some, some of our surprise or maybe not to all of our uh, surprise turns out that some of these nuns are more charitable than other nuns over the course of 30 years. Turns out that those who were more charitable uh, had a, a longer life expectancy, on average 12 years longer than those who were less charitable. Pretty provocative, I think. Interesting. Okay. We should also care about pro-social behaviors because parents communities care about pro-social behaviors. We all really do care about pro-social behaviors. We think about how is it that we can cooperate and work on things together to resolve problems and issues and all that kind of stuff. Well, the building blocks of that cooperation is being pro-social with each other, right? We think about relationships, interpersonal relationships. How is it that you make a new friend? Here's my new friend. I'll do something nice. I might compliment you, right? That makes you feel good, whatever. Maybe that'll make you more likely to do something nice for me in return, right? So we can create new friendships and positive interpersonal relationships with others by engaging in pro-social behaviors. We do it all the time. It's also good for intimate relationships, marital relationships. My guess is that the marker of a good marital relationship <laughs> is probably one in which the couple engages in these, this sort of reciprocal pro-social behavior, acts of pro-sociality, right? Problem. Five to one. Five to one. There's, there's a ratio. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I think that's pretty obvious. And of course, it has even broader societal benefits. Um, you know, we can talk about the global sort of social issues and other issues that we're facing um, and the need to be able to work together um, to solve some of these issues, right? And bringing people together, getting industry, private industries and governments to work together on some of these big, big issues, poverty, famine, climate change, disease, you name it. And all of that still doesn't convince you this is important. Well, let me throw some numbers at you. For those of who are a little money oriented, if you look at one form of pro-social behaviors, volunteerism, first of all, I wanted to point out, 22% of millennials, or at least 22% of them, are involved in volunteering activities. That translates into approximately 1.6 billion hours billion hours of service that would otherwise be paid, right, service. And that translates into a benefit to our economy, U.S. economy of $36.5 billion. So there's a lot of really good reasons, I think, to study this, these behaviors. It matters in many, many different ways. And there are other ways, by the way. And, but, so how do we get there? Well, I'm not going to give you my whole seminar on pro-social moral development today in one hour or whatever it is, but I'll just briefly touch on a few things. First of all, there's a biological, heritable um, coefficient and basis to pro-social behaviors, and this makes sense evolutionarily. It's important that we have this um, heritable tendency to cooperate with others, to be empathic towards others, to be pro-social towards others, right? We just simply think about the mother-child attachment relationship. That's on the basis of some of these neurotransmitters like oxytocin and serotonin that have been linked to pro-social behaviors. And oxytocin is also called the attachment hormone or the love hormone. Uh, similarly, there's a temperamental basis to uh, 
uh, pro-social behaviors, and if you adopt the Rothbard uh, very, very model of uh, temperament, an important aspect, dimension of that is self-regulation. Pro-social behaviors requires some self-regulation skills. It's a, it's a form of regulated behavior. Then the cognitive developmentalists and moral socialization theorists and researchers have already demonstrated to us the importance of things like sympathy, feelings of concern for others and sorrow, and there are physiological bases uh, for that kind of responding, moral reasoning, and moral values. People who endorse or more strongly endorse moral values are more likely to also be pro-social. There are also contextual characteristics, although the, the work on this is pretty sparse. Um, another hint for this occasion. But, um, but there is um, some evidence of links to things like uh, safer neighborhoods, um, better climate, school climate. Those contexts seem to facilitate more pro-social behaviors. And then finally, we have socialization agents, the whole gamut. Um, and um, and in, in my talk today, I'm going to probably I'm going to be sort of focusing uh, pretty much on, on parents. Okay, so let's get to some of the good stuff. What do we know so far, and especially what do we know so far about pro-social behaviors in Latino and Latina youth populations? Well, to start with, it's just a heuristic model that we use to think about some of these things, and it's pretty much we threw in the kitchen sink in here. Um, but it helps to remind us that all of these different sorts of factors play a role in predicting pro-social development. It's probably true of any phenomenon that we study. It's also true here. So don't memorize that. Let's get to some specific studies. I'll give you some examples. So um, this is one of uh, the early studies that um, we published looking specifically at discrimination experiences. Probably not a <clears throat> coincidence that I want to start out with this because we're sort of in an interesting climate right now in our country. But um, exposure to discrimination seems to predict, longitudinally predict, less pro-social behaviors on the part of Latino youth. One thing I want to immediately point out about this in terms of implications um, is that if we think about Latino youth, Latino, Latino youth, and uh, their place in our society, in the social um, stratification of our society, many of these youth are being marginalized if we are undermining their pro-social behaviors, which is a basic, important social mechanism for building relationships with others, then these discrimination experiences are obviously, possibly, obviously possible. Yeah. Uh, also undermining and facilitating that marginalization, isolation from the majority of society. But one thing I'll point out is that we looked at these different kinds of pro-social behaviors, and the one exception in which pro discrimination was positively associated with pro-social behaviors was public. Now public, I told you, is when you help someone in front of an audience. And you put this in the context of adolescence, and in other research that we've done looking at these six types, um, distinct types, we find that actually public pro-social behaviors seems to be associated with this sort of selfish motivation. You're, you're helping in front of others because usually you're trying to either elevate your social status or you're trying to gain their approval. So, why might discrimination experiences actually foster more of this, that form of pro-social behavior? Um, one possibility is that they're either trying to fit in with their peer group or they're trying to perhaps, it's a form of self-protection, so to speak. But it undermines the other forms of pro-social behaviors. Um, 
the other thing that we looked at was we tried to explain is there a mechanism by which we can explain this link between discrimination and pro-social behaviors? And what we found was that discrimination experiences seems to actually foster more and stronger endorsement of cult traditional Latino uh, cultural values, heritage values. Uh, and that, in turn, um, predicted uh, more pro-social behaviors. So, Cultural values seem to be a protective factor here. It actually seemed to reverse the negative consequences of discrimination experiences. And we think that part of what might be going on with the cultural values is that that may also be promoting these kids to explore more about their own ethnic identity and ethnic heritage. Here's a second study in which we looked at discrimination. This is a separate sample, and this is a sample of recent immigrant youth from California and from uh, Miami. And this, these are youth who have immigrated to the US within the last five years. Um, and we looked specifically at the, the, the public, which is the selfish sort of motivated form, and the altruistic, which is the more selfless motivated form. And as you can see from here, these youth a time one, longitudinal, who reported more discrimination in ex exposure, were again more likely to engage in the public, selfish, motivated forms of pro social behaviors, but they were less likely to engage in the selfless form. And then, very interestingly, as I alluded to earlier, the link to mental health and psychological health, you can see that altruistic, if they engaged in altruistic pro social behaviors, they were less likely to report depressive symptoms. So again, in this case, pro-social behaviors is a protective factor for depressive symptoms. Does this all make sense? You still awake? Okay. And we controlled for previous levels. Um, we also tested a partial reverse causal model, fancy term for, basically we flipped this around and we found support for that. So if they reported more discrimination experiences, that actually was positively associated with depressive symptoms, but depressive symptoms were then negatively associated with altruistic. So this partial reverse causal model of support, that probably made grammatical sense, but that suggests that there may be a cyclical sort of process going on here, right? If you are exposed to discrimination experiences, that seems to be not only undermining some forms of pro-social behaviors and fostering others, but it also seems to be also directly uh, related, uh, related to depressive symptoms and vice versa. <clears throat> Here's a little piece that some of the scholars here might be interested in as well. Um, when we looked at youth who reported um, high scores on biculturalism, so these are youth who are really trying to navigate both cultural work, their, their ethnic heritage uh, culture as well as majority uh, society culture, and they are endorsing or uh, trying to endorse both, both cultures rather than rejecting them. Those youth all later on reported more positive self-evaluations, more positive self-view, more higher self-worth. And that, in turn, was associated with higher levels of pro-social behaviors. Once again, we tested the partial reverse causal model, and we found it, that to be supported. So bicultural youth were more pro-social, and that also, in turn, predicted more positive self-views. So again, there are cyclical sort of processes that are occurring here, or seem to be occurring here. All right, here's one of my favorites with Katie. Anything you do with Katie is really fun. Uh, so this is uh, data from La Familia uh, Longitudinal uh, Project in uh, Arizona State. Um, and in this one, I, I don't want to become too overwhelmed, uh, maybe stacky, so probably really excited right now, but, but try and focus on the boxes. 
for now. Um, and I'm going to start with this side of the model first, because this is one of my areas that I'm very, very excited about. Um, there is uh, some literature, but very little literature, that exists um, that suggests that kids who engage in more pro-social behaviors also have better academic outcomes. And we know that academic disparities is, an, is, a, is a problem and a concern uh, amongst Latino, Latino populations. Um, and uh, in this study, we examined whether, in fact, earlier engaging in earlier pro-social behaviors did, in fact, predict better academic outcomes. And we found support for that. We found support that the better academic outcomes actually seem to be a function of improving their academic self-efficacy or their self-confidence in being good in school. So that's really pretty cool, and I think has a, this is the first and only data that I know of that demonstrates that pro-social behaviors, or suggests that pro-social behaviors might be an intervention mechanism by which we can foster and promote better academic outcomes in Latino and Latino youth. The other part of the model um, had to do with examining parenting. In the traditional parenting uh, literature, there's always been an emphasis on two dimensions of parenting styles, how warm your parents are and how controlling they are. How much control do they exert on the child, either psychological or behavioral control, um, and also how warm and nurturing and supportive. Right? You probably can guess that being, having a warm, nurturing parent is a good thing, and in fact, a lot of evidence supports that. In this study, we looked at these different sort of typologies of parenting styles. And so, for example, up here we examined whether um, mothers who were less involved, meaning that they exhibited low levels of both warmth and um, control, almost like permissive parents, you know, would think about that, as compared to what's termed authoritative parents. Authoritative parents are considered sort of the gold standard, at least in the traditional literature. <clears throat> Those are parents who are high up, very warm and nurturing, and then they're sort of moderately, moderate on control. So they're not overly controlling, but they're also not under controlling. The traditional parenting literature suggests that's the gold standard. That's the best type of parenting style. So when we compare those parents to the mothers who were less involved, well, of course, the mothers who were less involved, actually, that undermined their kids' pro-social behaviors, right? Does that make sense? Um, on the other hand, we also looked at mothers that we deemed to be moderately demanding. So they were moderate on control, but they were also moderate on warmth, so they weren't very warm. And compared to the authoritative gold standard moms, even those mothers tended to have kids who were less pro-social. It's not a very strong relation, but, but again, also remember, this is across uh, from fifth to tenth grade. It's, for us, that's kind of a big deal. <clears throat> okay, that's cool. But what about fathers? Well, once again, we found pretty much what we found over here, reported over here. But if you look over here, we found that there was a group of fathers that were also less involved, permissive, so to speak, and that undermined those sorts of behaviors. But here's the interesting one. We also found this category that actually scholars like Rebecca White at Arizona State has reported before, and we also find this in African American families and in Asian American families. And um, this parenting style has been termed no-nonsense parenting. In this case, we found it only for fathers, not for mothers. And what it, what, it, what it means is that basically there's a group of fathers, Latino fathers, who um, exhibit um, 
sorry, high warmth and high control. So they're very sort of demanding and you would otherwise consider them to be overly demanding, overly controlling. Um, but they also exhibit high levels of warmth. And in this study, like in other studies with African American and Asian heritage families, what they have found over and over again is that that parenting style is not associated with more problem outcomes, but in fact, it just doesn't predict outcomes in youth. So what this points to is one of these little things that we call sort of a cultural group difference. And it sort of supports the idea that we ought to be doing cross-cultural research and cross-ethnic group research. Um, and not just take traditional models and apply those traditional models into whatever cultural group we're researching. Okay. So I'll move it on. And what is my time? I'm sorry. We have until 2.30. You're in trouble. No, I could go on for a Okay. Um, let's talk about then how are these cultural group differences and individual differences in um, youth outcomes transmitted. Um, and so we have, for that, we have to look at um, cultural theories that exist. Um, theories from anthropologists and cultural uh, developmental scholars like the Super and Harkness and Whitings and Carolyn Edwards. Um, and from that work, um, those scholars have always pointed to sort of three dimensions that make up what they term the niche or the, the nest of a child. First is the customs and the practices that the child is exposed to. And across different ethnic groups, excuse me, different cultural groups, they may be exposed to different practices, or at least different levels, right, frequency of some practices. Secondly, important, we can't overlook their physical settings and their context, because whether they live in the U.S., or they live in Brazil, or they live in Puerto Rico, um, their kids are going to have different opportunities, in this case, different opportunities to engage in pro-social behaviors or not engage in pro-social behaviors, depending on their physical settings. Right? And last but not least, um, the third influence um, by which uh, caregivers and parents, families, and communities can influence um, their kids' outcomes is by the normative values, cultural values, and beliefs that they themselves endorse. Um, and different countries, different societies, there are going to be some different values. One of the most common one that's been criticized but actually still holds some water is, for example, the distinction between individualist-oriented societies and collectivist-oriented societies, right? Collectivist being those societies that are much more group oriented, right, and value communalism, versus those that are much more uh, self individual oriented. Um, one important um, concept from this work is also um, the cultural values transmission model. So if we think about how parents and caregivers' values. How are they transmitted from the parent to the child? Talk a little more about that. First, let's talk about values and beliefs. Well, values are abstract sorts of cognitive and affective uh, notions that are organized around some sort of social construct phenomenon. Values can be numerous, they can be broad, they can be narrow. I gave you an example of broad values, collectivist versus individualist, but obviously earlier I alluded, I alluded to moral values, right? That those could be much more narrow, right? Kindness, how much do you value being honest or fair, 
or tie you to others, right? Values are conceived to be um, influential and, and, and help guide how we behave uh, with others and how we behave and interact in our in social settings. And values uh, actually demonstrate some remarkable stability, um, not early in life, but as kids get older and certainly by adolescence, um, they're already demonstrating pretty good stability in terms of the values that they seem to have adopted and those that maybe they're less inclined to adopt or to reject. So in the Latino uh, literature, and scholars have identified several um, traditional cultural values. And let's be clear, these are not values that all Latinos equally strongly endorse. Now let's also be clear that these are not unique to Latinos. In fact, we find commonalities with other ethnic racial groups, but we also find commonalities, I think, in certain uh, subgroups within white European American populations, such as rural communities, rural families. Um, so this is not unique to Latinos. I want to make that very clear. However, the, the important thing is, is that there is variability. And actually, as a stat geek would tell you, variability is good for us. We want, that means that we have a chance to explain individual differences in whatever outcome we're studying when we find predictors or um, variables and where, where there's um, pretty good variability. The most commonly researched uh, traditional uh, Latino value, cultural value, is familismo or familism. And there are different conceptions of it. For our purposes, we adopt uh, a conception uh, promoted by um, Dr. George Knight. Um, it has sort of three dimensions. Actually, it's sort of four, but I'm going to focus on three. One, the first one, referent, is the extent to which um, you identify with your family unit, with your family. Your, how much, how close is your self-concept tied to the, uh, your family unit? You can probably imagine some examples of situations where um, parents, for example, might be, uh, might tell their kid, you know, you're, you're, you're bringing shame to our family. Second uh, dimension to familismo is um, the extent to which there's a felt duty or obligation to the family, right? Uh, you're not going to go out and play with your friends because you have to go to uh, quinceanera, your sister's quinceanera uh, party. And then the third aspect is uh, the extent to which uh, you rely on support and uh, provide support to your family, your family. Very important uh, value. Again, not all fam uh, Latino families strongly endorse or equally endorse this, but many do. And then there are some who um, maybe value other values. Another common value that's been identified by Latino scholars as being tied to uh, many Latino families is religiousness, their sense of religiousness or spirituality. Respect for authority figures, respect for parents, respect for elders, that's another value. And by the way, that can sometimes, of course, overlap with familismo. The collectivists, I sort of already covered that one. Oops. And, and of course, Many Latino cultures are more oriented towards, have that sort of group orientation, which could include the family, but also could include <coughs> the broader community. Okay. How are these values transmitted in Latinos and Latinas? Uh, well, there's a couple of processes. One is enculturation, which is um, the extent to which um, Family and caregivers and parents, in particular, um, in the U.S. and U.S. Latino families, 
are um, teaching their kids about their own ethnic heritage, right? They've been exposed them to both well, language, maybe a good one, uh, but you know, they might have them watching telenovelas or you know, listening to music, uh, Latino music. <coughs> Um, and then the other sort of process, the dynamic process that is uh, co-occurring is acculturation. And that's the child learning about the majority society that they're placed in, in the case of Latinos who have moved and or are growing up in a, um, in a community where they are not, especially when they're not the majority uh, group. Can you all see this? Okay. Um, and these sorts of things are being transmitted through practices that they're exposed to, rituals and customs, uh, observational learning, of course, children and adolescents are learning all the time by watching others, and direct tuition. Their parents might be talking to them about their, uh, their community from Okay. So, so because there's so much variability in these cultural values, especially when you have kids that and families who have immigrated to the U.S., and you've got these kids and families that are really sort of dealing with navigating both these enculturative sorts of experiences as well as these acculturative experiences, we thought, well, maybe these cultural values might be associated with pro-social behaviors. And what's more, these cultural values, which are sort of group-oriented, really seem to perhaps might orient the child or the youth to be much more other-oriented and less just self-oriented, right? Less less concerned about their own self, their own uh, personal self. So uh, in one of the early studies, um, we demonstrated that in fact, families and values, those adolescents who more strongly endorse families and values, they seem to also exhibit higher levels of um, pro-social behaviors. We also administered a measure that taps into what are associated uh, individualist sort of uh, oriented values and those values uh, were materialism the extent to which they value personal wealth <laughs> getting that nice uh, Tesla car or something like that. Um, and personal achievement to the extent to which they value their own personal you know uh, achieving uh, higher uh, higher status higher achievement it turns out that those Latino youth who more strongly endorsed those two uh, uh, mainstream U.S. values actually um, were more likely to exhibit public, the selfish form of pro-social behaviors. And they were also less likely to exhibit or report the altruistic helping, the selfless form. At this point, I want to pause briefly because I do want to make a very uh, sort of a footnote here. Um, so far I've sort of presented public pro-social behaviors as sort of, sort of negative, you know, this selfish orientation is sort of a bad sort of thing. I want to be clear, all of these pro-social behaviors are actually good. And they're certainly good if we think about relative to aggressive behaviors and antisocial the fact that they may be motivated by different sorts of motives or they may be moved by different sorts of motives, that's important, but in certain, under certain circumstances and in certain settings, it may actually be much more adaptive and healthier for kids to engage in a selfish form, selfish motivated form of pro-social behaviors. I want to make that clear because I don't want to, you know, paint this picture of like, oh, we should never be selfish. Yes, it's very important. And especially if we're thinking about Latino kids or minority kids in a, you know, in a context where they are maybe threatened or under, under threat, 
it is going to be important that sometimes they take care of themselves and protect themselves. And so engaging in pro-social behaviors is, is always going to be better than engaging in anti-social behaviors. Um, these are socially desirable behaviors because they benefit other people. That makes sense? Okay. Um, so here's um, using that recent immigrant population. Uh, one just very quickly show you that uh, mothers who were more uh, involved with their children, or with their adolescents, uh, those mothers seem to foster more of this collectivist, group-oriented value sort of thing, and that also positively predicted uh, pro-social behaviors. Um, we tested the reverse causal model. In this case, we went all the way back. So we tested whether earlier pro-social behaviors predicted um, collectivism values, and it did, but it was marginal. Uh, and then collectivism then actually also positively predicted uh, more maternal involvement. So, and that makes sense, right? I mean, moms are going to be uh, are probably going to like kids who are more pro-social, right? And that, and so they're probably going to get more involved with them. So again, it's this sort of relationship uh, benefit that comes from engaging in pro-social behaviors. But we wanted a, a full, fuller sort of test of this cultural tra values transmission model. So, so in this study, we looked at the mother's report of families and values, and we found that it was positively associated to parenting practices that actually fostered families. So these are practices where the parents, the mothers, were asking their kids to help around the house, to make their family a higher priority than other sorts of things. So, um, and then most importantly, when we, look, when we looked at the child's report of whether their mothers were engaging more frequently in those familism fostering parenting practices, we actually found a positive relation. And that in turn was associated with the stronger endorsement of those kids' uh, familism values, which in turn predicted more pro-social behavior. The problem with this study is that it's cross-sectional, so uh, let's move on to the better, stronger evidence. Longitudinal data, in this case, we looked at both mothers and fathers' endorsement of families and values. We found that it was positively associated to a measure of ethnic socialization practices, which is a little broader than familism parenting practices, but basically it's a measure that taps into the extent to which the parents are fostering uh, stronger cultural, uh, traditional cultural values in general and behaviors. We found that those practices were associated positively for mothers, but not for fathers, to the child's ethnic identity, the extent to which they identify, uh, the extent to which their ethnic heritage is central to their self-concept. And that was in turn positively associated to their own familism values, and that was positive to pro-social behaviors, except we found that it was negatively associated to altruistic behaviors. So what's happening here? Well, selfless, motivated forms of pro-social behaviors. One possibility is that the familism, endorsing familism values, may be promoting more pro-social behaviors, but perhaps those pro-social behaviors are geared and targeted more to in-group members and not out-group members. Possible, we don't know. Thesis, dissertation, something. Okay. Interestingly, we found that there was a direct link from the child's, the children who endorse more et uh, ethnic identity to their altruistic, to, uh, altruistic tendencies. One possibility there is that there is one value that I didn't mention before um, that is uh, termed bien educado, or well-educated. The literal translation is well-educated. But it's not referring necessarily to a good formal education, but it's a broader concept. It has more to do with uh, being a kid of good manners, well-mannered, good culture, uh, good character, child. 
child that's respectful of others, considerate of others. And so even though the familism value itself might be undermining altruistic behaviors, it appears as if the Latino parents are fostering this broader sort of stronger ethnic identity, affinity to their own ethnicity, that that, in fact, might be directly um, promoting more altruistic or selfless-oriented behaviors. There's more. When we look at parents who endorse the materialism and personal achievement values, we found, of course, parents who endorse that, but you know, parents who endorse that, both, both mothers and fathers. But their endorsement, those, those parents who endorse those values, that was not at all associated with the child's own endorsement of those values. So what's happening here? Well, if you recall, I talked about inculturative and acculturative uh, processes. How is it that youth learn about majority society? It's likely that they're learning about majority society, not from their parents, but from their peers, from the schools, from media, from other socialization. So it sort of makes sense that the parents' endorsement of these values isn't associated with the child, the children, or the youth who actually endorse those values. And then, very importantly, you can see that that endorsement of those values was pretty strongly negatively associated or associated with less altruistic pro-social behaviors. All right, so, conclude. First, cultural values and other culture-related mechanisms like ethnic identity, uh, and discrimination, and so forth, do actually help explain, help us to understand individual differences in pro-social behaviors within Latino populations, Latino and Latino youth. Secondly, in culturative practices, those practices where the parents are teaching their kids about their ethnic heritage, seems to foster stronger ethnic identity in kids and those in their kids and stronger families and values. All set. There is some evidence for some reverse causal of possible reverse causal effects. Of course, these are not the strongest uh, study designs for. Um, discerning cause and effect directions, but it's suggestive, it's provocative. And that evidence so far is suggesting that, that there are some cyclical processes occurring here. Some of these processes may actually help us to understand why in some societies Latino, Latina youth are segregated or voluntarily segregated from uh, hanging out with other ethnic um, groups um, and uh, also helped us, us to understand why they may also be um, less prone to mental health problems and uh, some issues like that. We have still a lot of research to, to uh, conduct. I gave you some ideas. If anybody picks up on any of these ideas, I expect to be co-author or at least get some money from your grant. Um, but some of these areas are things like uh, research on recent immigrants. I think that population is particularly interesting because they're undergoing rapid changes in these sort of acculturative and enculturative sorts of uh, processes. We also need more research on rural Latinos and Latinas. I, don't, I, you know, I haven't done any sort of regression weights or anything like that or uh, exact survey of the literature, but the vast majority of research on Latino Latino populations has been in large urban areas or in areas where there are dense uh, or substantial uh, proportion of Latinos and Latinas residing, and not in areas where I have been, Nebraska and Missouri. So, and, and those Latino families are, that's a very distinct context, context and they are facing very distinct challenges and the families and the parents and the kids are facing some really tough, tough challenges. Um, all of this is to say that we need to integrate culture-related mechanisms into our traditional models. So remember, I talked about the traditional models 
of moral development. And all of this is also to say that, you know, um, we really do need studies that focus on not just looking at factors that uh, mitigate negative outcomes, but factors that enhance positive outcomes and factors that predict positive outcomes. Um, it's very, very important. Um, we don't really need to spend a whole lot of time about um, the stereotypes and the, and the negative consequences of, uh, and the risks and dangers of reinforcing negative stereotypes in Latino and Latina populations, as well as other ethnic and racial and um, other minority groups. With that, I am done. Thank you very much. also looked at family size that may be related to familism and pro-social behaviors and the role of siblings um, that contribute to those kind of outcomes as well. Um, yeah, excellent uh, question. Um, we haven't looked specifically at family size, but we have looked at siblings, the role of siblings. One of my colleagues in my department is Sarah Killeran, who's worked with Kim Updegraff and Adriana Manya Taylor and others. Um, and it's her fault I've gotten into examining the role of siblings on um, pro-social behaviors and we do find, as you would expect, that sibling support seems to foster pro-social behaviors in uh, Latino and Latina youth and adolescents. And that effect is unique over and above the effects of parent support. So definitely an area, it's just starting in fact, the research that sort of mischaracterized it, it's, it's not longitudinal research, but it's cross-sectional research. So it would be great if there were longitudinal data and somebody wanted to do a thesis or dissertation um, on that project. But yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's very important because they do spend a lot of time with their siblings, um, those who have siblings. So it, it's to be expected that they ought to have some impact on their pro-social behaviors. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Yes? Okay, so I think my question is about the earlier part of the presentation. So I'm just wondering when you examine association between discrimination and pro-social behaviors, are you interested in distinguishing social or uh, pro-social behaviors toward the general population or toward folks in their own minority group? Another great area, open area of research. Um, in our studies, unfortunately, especially in these studies, um, there is no, we don't specify the target or the recipient of pro-social behaviors. However, our most recent projects that we've just begun, we have added targets. So we're looking at both type of pro-social behavior and also target pro-social behaviors. One of my former uh, grad students, who was a professor at BYU, she developed a measure of pro-social behaviors towards friends, families, friends, family, strangers. <laughs> Somebody knows. That's <laughs> better than me. Okay. Um, and, um, and then, and so that's one body of work that we just started and we're now including because that is an important issue and I think I alluded to the importance of understanding especially some of those relations to altruistic, whether it's that they're more prone to help in group rather than out group. And, um, the other project that uh, I just started collaboration this summer actually is with a colleague at Queen's University in Belfast. Um, and uh, we're, we're starting projects looking at in-group, out-group, pro-social behaviors towards in-group and out-group. Um, but these are youth from Northern Ireland. And so this is really interesting to me because instead of looking at what we're looking at with regards to ethnicity, 
and race discrimination, and that who we're, we're starting to look at uh, these same sorts of mechanisms, or similar mechanisms, with regards to uh, across religious and social political groups, Catholics and Protestant youth. There's still a lot of hostility, even though in 1998 they reached peace accords. There's still a lot of hostility, and there's still a lot of segregation. In fact, schools are still segregated by Catholics versus Protestants. So that's a really fascinating um, and exciting new area. So I'm very, very inter keen, keenly interested in starting to look at those sorts of things. Excellent. Stage here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking about um, um, whenever Dr. Romero brought up siblings about um, like the exposure and the time spent with siblings. I was, and the first thing I thought of was like in the classroom where I was like teaching and, or teachers. And so uh, going back to the parenting styles, I was wondering if there's any research on like what type of teaching style may um, help students with social That's a dissertation right there. Good <laughs> <laughs> um, The short answer is no. Um, not that I know of, not that I'm aware of. Uh, there's a good colleague that I know, uh, Christy Bergen, you may want to look up some of her work. She actually just published a book on pro-social behaviors in schools. It's a really good book, but I don't recall reading anything specific to applying this sort of typology to teachers and looking to see how that is related to pro-social behaviors. So in the work in schools, uh, there's another person, Kathy Wenzel, at the University of Maryland. She's done work on um, pro-social behaviors in, in the schools and amongst peers. Um, and a lot of that work either looks at, um, I'm sorry, it looks at, um, so they look at things like um, popularity or, of kids and whether they're more pro-social and all, and yes, they are. Um, and uh, or kids who are withdrawn or rejected. Um, they also look at, um, they, they do look at, well actually we've done a little bit of work looking at peer support, but that's not necessarily in the classroom um, or in schools. Um, oh, I did mention the school climate stuff. So there is some work in school settings, uh, but it's, it's uh, I think it's limited. So that's absolutely a great area. <coughs> so my question was about peers, and I think you addressed it <coughs> to a degree, and that is, you know, as you approach adolescence, understanding your peers become as important or more important than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as so, important for sure. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I um, for a while I had this, you know, I've had a lot of wild and crazy ideas, but one of my little wild and crazy ideas, in a geeky sort of way, is to, um, I'm really interested in looking at, um, at some point, looking who their friends are, and looking at, at the uh, ethnicity, you know, are they hanging out more with, you know, same ethnic uh, group friends, or are they hanging out with a more diverse group of friends, and then looking at, Social behaviors, you know, interactions within those within those yeah, groups. Yeah, that's like that would be more. Yeah, they're they're friends pro social yeah. behaviors, mm -hmm. and they sort of gravitate to people that are more pro social or less pro social, right? Or publicly pro social, right? Or right. Pro -social. And in fact, you could start to ask questions about not only do they gravitate to more pro social peers, and they do, by the way. Uh, and they do avoid deviant peers, that we do know. Um, but also to the, the extent to which they place that as a, as a major decision point, so to speak, versus the ethnicity of the group, right? So am I more likely to become a friend of a white European American person who's pro-social to me, versus becoming friends with um, another Latino who might not be so pro-social, but is of my same group. Well, and you pointed out earlier that even these deviants have their own code Absolutely. of pro-sociality. And Absolutely. I think even looking at those people within those deviant groups might be fascinating, whether it be street gangs or street kids or 
or whatever group you're mm -hmm. interested in, but what is the tool within those? Yeah. Certainly they're pro-social parts of it. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I, again, I do want to emphasize that there, you know, this is not, um, you know, there's a lot of grayness, you know, and that, uh, and that, uh, you know, even the kids who are exhibiting or reporting high levels of altruistic helping might not necessarily all be, you know, angels. Right. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> what, what a concept, right? Discovery. Most parents know that, <laughs> and teachers, and educators, <laughs> and all of us. Yes. So you mentioned earlier in your presentation that discrimination was associated with in some interesting ways to for social behavior in you know in the youth. I'm wondering if have you looked at maybe had it, um, other stressors not necessarily related to discrimination that minority youth might experience. Uh, yes or no. So um, I was mentioning to Katie earlier, yeah, that, that we did conduct uh, an, an, there's a sort of older study, it's not longitudinal, but we just used a, a general measure of acculturative stress, cultural stress, and so it was looking at different forms of stress. Um, um, yeah, uh, of course, I'm going to blank out. Uh, but one of the items, for example, was immigration uh, related stress. I mean, I don't remember the exact item, but there were other, you know, oh, language was another one, uh, you know, accents and minority you discriminated on the basis of your language fluency. Um, and we did find that it was associated with pro social behaviors and pretty much in the same manner as the discrimination. Now, the reason I said no is because we did have, of course, discrimination items within this larger set of items of cultural stress. Um, I can also say that we have begun to, we have a project that we collect the data on, where we actually tried to dive deeper into these different forms of stress, but in a, in a sort of different way. So we're, we have a project where we're trying to look at chronic stressors versus acute stressors, you know, like Event specific stressors. Uh, we're also look, trying to look at sever the severity of the stress, you know, to see whether those things are associated with pro-social behaviors in different ways. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't give you any findings because we just finished collecting the data. But there will be some data out there, some at some point, hopefully published, that we'll start to. And unfortunately, that's not longitudinal either. That's just cross-sectional. Uh, and the last thing I will say that is definitely associated with pro-social behaviors, although we haven't looked at it with a Latino sample, is economic stress. So the family stress model, which many of you may be familiar with, where uh, exposure to economic strain, you know, difficulties in paying bills and, and unemployment in the family and all that, that's associated with uh, depressive symptoms in mothers in this case. Uh, and that's associated with less positive parenting practices, less supportive parents, mothers, all of this is mothers. And that in turn predicts lower levels of pro-social behaviors. Now, bad news is that, that wasn't with the Latino sample. The good news though is that it was, it is longitudinal and there is support for the family stress model impacting and undermining pro-social behaviors in white European American youth. So yeah, absolutely. Different forms of stress would be really an interesting area for future inquiry. So I just want to be mindful of everyone's time, especially Dr. Carlo. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Dr. Carlo, for being with Thank us. You. And keep an eye out for our Turberville Speaker Series um, in the spring. Thank you.